Uh, thanks to, to Ben for organising this event um, and the Biodiversity Information Service. It's really nice actually to have um, or to work with you guys and have this, um, this new kind of collaboration that we've started. It's nice to get um, as many people kind of talking about this as we can. And as we've kind of mentioned, I think already as we've gone through, it's obviously the big farm and bird count. And this is really focused at farmers and getting farmers out there on their ground, uh, monitoring what wildlife they've got and then inputting the results. So it's a big, big focus on farmers and it's really lovely to see that we've got so many farmers attending, but also for those people that aren't farmers and are really keen bird watchers, what we would normally say in any other year is, you know, uh, make friends with your local farmer, go out with them and help them and all the rest. Now, obviously with the current um, COVID restrictions, we can't be advising you to do that. Although I think they've just allowed uh, exercise with someone else, but, um, don't take me as gospel on that, always check first. I don't want to get into to any trouble. But what I would say is if you are planning on, if you haven't got your own farm, and if you're planning on doing this for a farmer, it's absolutely essential that you talk to them and you get permission from them. Um, so that being said, I'll, I'll move on now. So for those of you that aren't aware who the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust are, we've been set up now for, I think since the 1930s, so over 80 years, and we do scientific research into all matters of the, the countryside. Um, historically, a very large focus on, on game bird populations, and from that then has been kind of conservation techniques based in, in game management, which have had great success in you know, the conservation community. So things like beetle banks and cover crops and, um, unsprayed cereal headlands and all these kind of things have had a uh, great take up within agro-environmental schemes and I heard someone say once that over the border in England with the countryside stewardship I think that about 70 percent of the options within there reflected our science in some way um, so that's really good and we use that science to shape agricultural and environmental policies and there's an awful lot of negativity um, in the press to do with farmers and these wildlife declines. Um, but we see farmers as part of the solution. In Wales, over 80% of the, the land is managed by farmers. And I think over the UK, because we've got many people participating tonight from, from England um, as well, I think it's 72% of the UK. Um, so there's a, a massive kind of opportunity and ability to um, conserve wildlife. And we're not talking about nature reserves here, and that's really important. Food is the primary kind of production, primary focus, but we strongly believe that you can have wildlife and that can fit hand in hand with a profitable, productive farm. So that's really key. And we've got uh, our research centre over in, in Leicestershire in England, the Allerton Project has been running since 1992. Uh, and that's just one example of one of our kind of projects, but there's almost 30 um, years of research there and data showing and demonstrating that you can have wildlife alongside a profitable farm and believe me you know it's on heavy clays it's not an easy farm to get that profit on um, but we've we've managed to kind of double and sometimes triple uh, in some cases triple wildlife and farm and bird numbers um, by doing some of the methods I'm going to be talking to you about today so although we have got these declines and no one is trying to hide away from that there's an awful lot of good work going on and there's an awful lot of kind of farmers that are turning the tide and actually reversing those declines. And it's for this reason that the farm and bird, that the big farm and bird cut was set up. It's to kind of shout from the rooftops and celebrate those success stories. And hopefully by doing that, encourage lots of other people to join in with that and kind of up their game too. So that's really important. So it's all about kind of positivity and good press really um, for, for farmers that are doing the right thing and doing lots of good things. But it's also, you know, it's not knocking anyone. It's trying to bring everyone up um, and, and hopefully, you know, you may get some ideas of how to do that. So this presentation um, is focused as I, you know, I work out of Wales and, and Wales is primarily my main focus. It's focused on, on grasslands and livestock farming although there is some information on, on arable farms in there too. So um, I'll move on to the next slide. And the reason I said before, obviously, food production for farms is such a massive thing. 50 years ago, um, the amount of ground needed um, to produce food per kind of head of population was about two acres. Today, that's about half an acre. So, you know, we've got less land to produce food for more people, if you like. 
Um, and that's why we've, we've really got, obviously got to carry on producing food. Um, but as I said, even with those kind of stats, we can still bring wildlife into that equation. So that's, that's really the focus. What we're asking you to do and what kind of my part of this talk is all about is the big farm and bird camp. And I'm here to, to advertise that and get you to go out, uh, pick up your binoculars and, and go out and, and collect some data, but then importantly, also um, upload that information as well. So uh, this starts on Friday the 5th. So this Friday uh, for, it's about, I think it's two weekends and a week in between till the 14th of February. It's, we're not asking you to go out every day throughout that window, but we're asking you to go out once in that window and undertake a count and it takes 30 minutes to do so. And then once you've done that, we'd ask you to go onto this website here. It's bfbc.org.uk and upload that information. Uh, and then we'll get all of that data and we can do lots of good press releases and kind of shout about all the good work that's being done. Um, and on that sheet as well, on that website, you can get your uh, count sheets and your spotters guides and all these things that are going to help you with that count too. So please go and check that out. I should point out as well, our main sponsors uh, for the event are the NFU, although we have all of these fantastic partners of which I'll be adding BIS to the, the list next year, if that's all right with you, Ben. Uh, and this is an ever-growing list of, of, of partners um, because I think many people now realise that this is such a, a good news story, really, and something good to get behind. Um, and with that, so every entrance entry that goes in uh, on the website, you'll be entered into a prize draw. So there's a couple of prizes, I think one of which is, is um, to receive a ton of supplementary feed, which if you're not sure what a supplementary feed is at this point, you'll, you'll know by the end. So I'll be talking quite a bit about that. Um, I, I've just mentioned this bit, obviously, when the dates are. The best way to do this, and the, the most likely way of seeing lots of birds, is to go to an area where you think that you'll see lots of birds, but then to stay there. We, you know, you can do this, you can go to two places if you want and split your count up into 15 minutes in each place. And if you really wanted to, you could do it by walking around. But the best way of seeing lots of birds is to sit quietly and still in one area. And as those birds kind of either get used to you being there or come into the area and they're not, not sure that you're there because you're being quiet and still, you'll see lots of birds that way. And the best areas to go to, is to and the reason why it will become apparent as I go through this, um, but the best areas to go to is if you've got any cover crops, any game covers or wild bird seed mixes and somewhere where supplementary feeding is taking place. So those two things combined, I kind of talk about those as a holy grail because that's for me what they are in Wales especially. Um, is to get much more take up of these things. But if you can get those things, they act as almost like magnets to draw birds in. And that's where you'll see plenty of birds. If you, if you haven't got those on your ground, then, you know, either near a woodland or a thick hedgerow with a bit of kind of rough scrubby cover in a field corner, or where there's a water course or an infield pond, those kind of areas where you've got a couple of habitats mixing together, they're where you'll, you'll find birds really. Instead of being, you know, stood in the middle of a grass field, you'll probably see less. <laughs> Um, what happens after the count. So it takes about 10 minutes, five if you're, you're you know, a whiz on the computer, but probably maximum about 10 minutes to, to upload this information onto the computer. And then you'll get, um, you'll get an online record. You'll be able to, to have your information fed back to you. Um, but then also you can compare that data. So you can compare it regionally and also nationally as well to see how you're doing. And then the idea is obviously if you can do this year on year and then you're also putting different management in place, you can see if that's increasing the number of birds, you can see if it's working or if you need to adjust your management slightly. So I always say, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And that's really true in, in the case of wildlife as well as obviously what you're managing on your farms. Uh, and then, you know, within the record there, there are links to uh, species information sheets and all those kind of things there. So you'll get that too. Uh, and what can we do with that information? So we normally put out these things which are called infographics uh, and they tell, they kind of summarise all of the main points. So this is a, a couple from the last few years and it tells us, you know, how many um, farms from those that submitted the data, how many of them are doing some form of supplementary feeding, as I mentioned before, or cover crops, or how many of those have seen red listed species or amber listed species. So it gives us some nice information there, but it also it allows us to take this information to the policy makers and the press. And as I said, you know, actually give a really positive story 
um, and promote what's been doing wrong with what's going on out there. So farmland birds, as Simon has mentioned, you know, I don't think there was any, any point in, in trying to um, pull any punches with this, you know, farmland birds are in a decline. Okay, so there's some great work being done out there, but they are in decline. And we're not trying to hide that fact by shouting about all the great work being done. What we're trying to do is show people the great work being done. And then perhaps um, some of the places where they, they haven't been doing that work and we're trying to build an interest in it, we're showing them how to, how to do that great work. So we want to, to get everyone, you know, to increase the standards in terms of wildlife conservation and reverse these declines. And we're really confident that we've got a, almost a model of how to reverse these declines and especially in seed eating birds, seed eating farmland birds, but also in, you know, in some of those wader species as well. Um, and I'll go on to that in a bit. But this is just to kind of uh, emphasize that point really. You'll notice there that the line in red is a farmland bird. And since 1970 on this graph, I think the count started in, in 1967. Simon, you might know that better than me. Um, but you can see since then, you know, we've had this, this almost crash in, in farmland birds. Um, and it's no, no doubt it's got, um, I think, kind of intensification of agriculture has had an impact on that, as well as a few other things too. So um, these are the other things. Normally when we're doing this face-to-face, -face, I might ask people in the room, um, what do we think the reasons are? And this, you know, most people come up with this list. So intensification of agriculture. And with that, one of the key things here is increasing pesticide and fertilizer use. Because obviously if you're getting rid of weed species, you're getting rid of the seeds on those weeds but also you're getting rid of uh, habitat for insects and and I'll talk about kind of insect rich habitats and how important they are because as much as we're talking now about seeds and the birds needing those to survive the winter when it comes to chick rearing and, and you know brood rearing rearing those chicks uh, insects are what, what's needed so we need insect rich habitat and if you're wiping out all the weeds and then if also if you're putting insecticide on too then we you know these birds haven't really got a hope um, so you'll, you'll see that list there, and I've kind of uh, highlighted the ones, put in bold, the ones I think are the, some of the key issues in Wales, because, you know, I was talking to Simon before, and although he's got quite a bit of arable still around him, and actually I have a bit around me too, up in North East Wales, but I think arable farming in, uh, in Wales now is only about 14% of Wales is classed as arable. And in, over the border in England, a lot of the kind of the blame in farmland bird declines has come from the intensification of arable and, and as I said those the increase in pesticide and fertilizer use but actually if you look at a lot of whales it's kind of low input we haven't really got the same uh, problems in the same kind of intensity as what's going on elsewhere but you could almost say the problem is the, the opposite end of the spectrum there and the loss of mixed farming so losing any cropping at all and, you know, more take up of, of uh, silage and, and livestock farming. But we, if you look out now across the majority of Wales on a lot of the grass fields, there's hardly any seed out there at all. And Simon was saying before about um, the loss of kind of over, over winter stumbles. So any cropping that we do have has moved from spring cropping to winter cropping. And with it, there's lots of consequences for wildlife. Um, but just losing any cropping at all, you obviously lose your stubbles, but you lose any seeds either as well. So that's that's key for me. Uh, for our wader species, as, as Simon mentioned, our lapwings and our curlews, especially the drainage of land has been one of the issues there. And loss of habitat. So we all know, obviously, in the past, our you know 1970s and ripping out hedges and things like that, all incentivized by the government, I would add. Um, but that really. I think it's it's important to add at this point that that loss of habitat has kind of it, you know it was a decline and it's plateaued. So uh, and in some cases that habitat is increasing through schemes like tear gothel and glass deer. But one of my main points and, and things I want to get across today really is that the amount of money that has been spent in Wales in tear gothel and, and glass deer and over the border in the countryside stewardship schemes on habitat alone, and we haven't as a nation. Kind of reverse those declines yet it hasn't kind of met its objectives so for us and the gwct we believe that there's there's more to that picture than just habitat and i would never say i'd never ever say that habitat isn't important it is it's the foundation of any kind of conservation work but it's not the whole picture and hopefully you'll get that as we go through this this presentation 
Um, now we've got an increase in predators and we've also got climate change in the picture there too. So the key thing here is that it isn't all doom and gloom and it is meant to be positive. And this is the, the Allerton project. These are the results from the, the, the our um, demonstration farm that I mentioned before. So in blue there, you've got that national decline uh, in breeding birds. And the red line is our um, increase in breeding birds at the Allerton project since 1992 when we started. And we basically implemented habitat where we could. So fitting it in with the farm on the un unproductive areas. And also then we implemented this thing called supplementary feeding, which I'll talk about in a bit, and also predator control as well, because there was um, uh, a shoot on the site there. And those three things combined, we were recording all of our kind of farm and bird species, and they all went, you know, the, the, the numbers just rocketed up. And, and it was really important, actually, for policy at the time, because those declines from 1966 here took decades and decades and decades to get as low as they got. And everyone at the time was saying, well, actually, you know, if we can do some improvements, it's, it'll, it'll take decades to improve them. And you can see there within a couple of years of doing this, they just shut up. So that's really important to note there. So I call this our GWCT three-legged stool. Uh, and it was originally put up by um, a famous kind of scientist who used to be, um, unfortunately he's passed away, but, um, he used to be the uh, director for the, the GWCT um, uh, called Dick Potts. He came up with a three-legged stool kind of principle, and I've just adjusted it slightly for whales. So the, what we look at here is habitat, and that habitat can be nesting habitat. Obviously vital, that's the first step. We've got to have somewhere to, to nest. Um, secondly, insect-rich habitat in the, in the late spring and summer, really important to be feeding the chicks. And then winter weather protection, um, so cover from the, the elements, so cover from the wind and the rain and the snow, but also protection from predators as well. And also that can double up as a food source. So uh, seed bearing cover crops is what we'll get onto later as a holy grail. Uh, food provision, really important. So seed in the winter and the spring and insects in the summer, as I've mentioned, and legal predator control into that. So um, this, and this is important because it must be before um, the, the eggs are produced, so or just as the eggs are produced, um, because we've got some nuances with our general licences in Wales now. So we've got to protect eggs, and we've got to protect chicks, and that's got to continue to you know to protect those fledging birds. Um, and within that, there's a suite of predators that we can control legally, being foxes, being some of the main ones, and corvids, so your carrion crows and your magpies, which we mentioned before, rats, and then mustelids such as weasels, uh, stoat, and mink. And if you control the suite of predators, that's when you can have a really um, huge impact, really. And I appreciate that not everyone on this uh, call participating will be uh, that interested in predator control, and some may not uh, like it, but I've got some results to show you later that it certainly works. Um, so I'll be showing you that later. And kind of this is important because kind of love it or loathe it, it is an important part of conservation. And it's all, a lot of this has come from our research and even you know, the likes of the RSPB use predator control now on their reserves to protect kind of birds of conservation concern. So uh, it's a known conservation method, I, I should say. So moving on, I've kind of mentioned this already. Uh, we need nesting sites, we need insect rich habitat, and we need areas. Uh, seed. So these are the important things. But what I would say is that uh, the way that we deliver these requirements differ depending on the species. And again, managing and recording what species you've got can kind of, you can then tailor your management for certain birds. Uh, so for example, yellow hammers, if you're, if you're interested in yellow hammers as a species, which you, know, you used to have a lot of, and you're keen to get more of them, you're keen to get them back. They like a nice kind of tight, thick hedgerow and they nest in the bottom of that hedgerow or in the scrub next to that hedgerow. So it's no good farming right up to the hedge if you're after yellow hammers. But another example of that is if you're trying to um, conserve tree sparrows, then putting up nesting boxes is one of the things which is really vital for them. And putting up nesting boxes um, so they can nest in a colony or maybe uh, an oak tree in the corner of a field. And then if you've got a cover crop with something like quinoa next to that, um, you know, you're onto a winner with that. So depending on what species you're after, you can tailor your, the way that you're doing these conservation efforts. So I like to include this picture because it's starting from a clean slate, as I like to call it. So there isn't much there for wildlife. And to be honest, 
there's not that much there for sheep either for stock. So there's lots of evidence out there on how uh, things like hedgerows and shelter belts are really good for stock production and it gives them shelter from the elements and you get kind of increased weight gain and all that kind of stuff. So really from an agricultural point of view, those fence lines there that you can see separating the fields, um, you know, it's not doing much for those sheep. So uh, I always think of this as a, a, as a blank slate, as I said, and for our um, for our farmland birds and especially our songbirds, there's not much there. So what can we add into that picture? So a good, good thick hedgerow is really important. But if I'm honest here, you know, I, I said before, there's a lot of hedgerows been planted and we've got a lot more hedgerows in the environment than we had, say, a couple of decades ago. But I see a lot of good, nice hedgerows that are farmed right into the base of the hedgerow. And I've just said how important it is for kind of sheep um, as to get protection from that, that hedgerow. So I'm not expecting you to do something like this on, on every, you know, you've got four hedgerows in the field uh, on every single hedgerow. But if you were to do this on one hedgerow, it'd be more than is currently going on. And that's the point here is to just do something extra and those ones and two percent can then add up. And if you've got something like a farm cluster where your community of farmers are all working together, those one and two percent actually are magnified and they become much more um, so doing something like this where you've got a bit of a buffer strip and tussocky grass and things like that next to a hedge uh, is really beneficial, uh, especially to things like yellow hammers that they mentioned and things like linnets too. Um, so that's what we're looking for there. Again, you know, if, you, if you're cutting silage and you've got um, an area of your field, there might be an oak tree stuck out into it or whatever, and it might be an awkward corner. Leaving that, that can have huge benefits too. So kind of scrubby corners are, are useful. Or if you've got a ditch along there, you know, having a, 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 um, a buffer along there is really important too. And that might look like this. Um, this is a really kind of common practice. Lots more people are doing this now. There's lots of grants for this kind of thing. And apart from, um, you know, minimising diffuse pollution and runoff off those fields, what that's also doing, if you're not fencing right up to the, the waterway, is you're, you're creating a bit of habitat. That habitat, again, will get thicker. Um, it's important to be able to manage that as you go on. So maybe cut that every three to five or seven years. Um, but what you've got there is a habitat that's great for things like uh, reed buntings. And there's lots of insects in there. It provides nesting habitat for other species as well, apart from farmland birds. Obviously, I'm here to talk about the big farmland bird count, but things like water vole as well uh, will come back to areas like that. Moving on, without fencing it off, obviously, putting things like scrapes in and instead of having a, a, a thin deep drain actually having a, a shallow wide ditch and drain and scrape that kind of thing is fantastic for things like lapwing uh, you get a lot of invertebrates in these areas and that's their chick food so as i said before depending on what you're looking at and trying to conserve will depend on what you're trying to put in place in your farm uh, moving on, we've got um, herbivorous swords or multi-species lays. Uh, there's lots of work going on within the agricultural community on these at the moment and things like rotational grazing and all this kind of stuff, which is all great and soil health as well, improving the health of our soils. But on top of all of that is the fact that these are insect rich. You'll get lots more insects instead of a monoculture ryegrass. So that's really important there. And obviously going back to the days of hay meadows, you know, I, you know, I'm in my 30s, I'm not that old, but I remember, you know, many, many more swallows when I was younger, and you'd see them in places like this, and it'd be the, you know, the skies would be full of swallows, and they'd be over fields like this because of the amount of insects in fields like this, so that's really important, and again, I'm not talking about having all of your farm being converted into hay meadows, but, you know, if you can get a small field or an area and just do this kind of thing, then that will make a big, big difference. Brassica forage crops, um, again, you know, great for, for sheep and uh, a variety in their diet and lots of health gains for sheep in that instance. But also this time of year, you've got a warmer crop. Um, you've got somewhere where you've got kind of thrushes and blackbirds and meadow pipits and things like that getting into there because it's a bit of a microclimate, it's a bit warmer. You've got overwintering insects in there as well. So they're great on their own, really. And they're almost what I'm going to be talking about later is in cover crops. So if you can leave these for as long as you can before you get the, the sheep to browse them off, um, that's going to be really beneficial. And these are the instances where I'll be talking about before putting up kind of um, supplementary songbird specific farmer bird feeders. You can put them in these kind of fields. You'll have great results, really. 
And finally, I think this is finally anyway, moving on in terms of livestock farming, what can be done? Uh, silage fields. In terms of wildlife, silage fields get a lot of negative press. Uh, from curly before, as we were talking about, you will get curly trying to nest in silage fields. So if a curly is not being predated, or oh, the eggs aren't getting predated, the chicks aren't getting predated, they're either getting that or they're getting mown up by you know, silage cutting. Uh, and that's the unfortunate truth of it. So that's also one of the kind of the, the main causes of declines in curlies in Wales. But in terms of, you know, I appreciate that silage needs to be grown. Um, and what we can do is kind of thin strips next to a field, so five or six metre strips of this. If you could, instead of cutting that, if you allow that to set seed, there's been research done by the RSPB on this one that, the you know the benefits to things like yellow hammers by doing this is quite good so uh, there's just in you know putting in small things where you can so in your margins where the land is less productive because you're you know you're next to a hedgerow it's being shaded etc um that's really key to just doing little bits where you can moving on then to some arable areas uh, this is a fallow plot out in the middle of a field for lapwing they like to, they don't like to be next to hedgerows, they like to be out in the middle where they can see predators coming in. And putting a fallow plot in is, is a, you know, some of the best things you can do. If you're an arable farmer and you've made the, you know, the move as many have towards winter cereals, so winter wheat and such, then um, putting these fallow plots in, or firstly putting, going back, or putting a field of, of a spring sown cereal in is it's one of the best things you can do. But if you can't do that, then putting a fallow plot in, and, and these are funded by um, stewardship schemes in both countries, in, in Wales and in England. Um, and the best places to put them is where you've historically seen lapwings breeding. Um, so they're absolutely great. And uh, if you can, if you're that way inclined, you can also put an electric fence around these to stop things like foxes and badgers getting to the nest, and that increases your, um, your egg hatching success rate. Um, so that's one thing that can be done for lapwing and then also fallow plots for skylarks. So again, the best thing you could do if you're an arable farmer is to put spring sown cereals in. And the best thing you can do for skylarks if you're um, a livestock, you know, a grass farmer, is to introduce <laughs> spring sown cereal. But if you can't do that in winter cereals, just lifting the drill as you're, you know, as you, as you're drilling, obviously, um, and leaving it. The, these strips are about four by four metres. And it's estimated that you'd only need two per hectare. So that's something like, I'm going to be, be a bit geeky here, but it's about 0.3% of the field or percent of that hectare. Um, so you're not really losing much yield at all. And again, you can get payments for these. You can get payments for this in England, but currently you can't in Wales, unfortunately. But by doing this, it's been shown that you can dramatically increase skylark populations. And I'm sure I read that only, um, I think it's only 20, if only 20% 20 of arable farmers did this, then we would stop um, skylark declines dead in the tracks. So this is a really kind of key method for conserving skylarks. And the reason being is that winter cereals, although skylarks can get nest in them to begin with and maybe get their first brood away, soon they get too kind of thick for them to forage in and nest in, whereas a spring summer cereal doesn't. And interestingly with skylarks, they need three broods per year to maintain that population. So you can see all of a sudden why things like this are really important. Moving on for those arable farmers, this is the kind of thing we'll be talking about uh, with arable farms is a nice, uh, a nice margin next to the hedgerow. That's absolutely great for, um, for birds that you know, ground nesting birds to, to nest in, going back to the kind of the, the kind of core of GWCT and a lot of our historic research, uh, that would be great for things like grey partridges. And although Simon mentioned before, obviously grey partridge is declining, there's so many success stories where um, farms and, and shoots and farmer clusters are doing work, conservation work specifically for grey partridges. And actually they act as a, almost like a keystone species in that if you conserve the grey partridge, the methods that you use to conserve that partridge benefit a whole host of other farm and wildlife as well. So you, you actually increase all the farm and wildlife by just focusing on that one bird. And we've got um, an interreg project across quite a few, I think it's eight countries in Europe, all doing this and all aiming to increase their biodiversity by 30% on each demonstration farm within five years. And they're all being successful following these methods. So that's nesting habitat. We've got something called brood, uh, brood rearing habitat there, uh, quite a bit of phacelia in there. You'll notice with that that it's not too thick. 
um, so that birds foraging in there don't get too wet and then die of pneumonia. But then also it's lots, it's full of insects. Um, moving on, you've got a cultivated but uncropped headland there. And that's where you've got a lot of these arable weeds coming up. So lots of poppies and things like that. And again, full of insects are really good. And a, uh, a cereal headland there, unharvested. And that will be also unsprayed cereal headland, which again would be full of weeds. And this time of year, well, a bit earlier in the winter, full of seeds as well. So there's a couple of things you can do there as arable farmers. But moving on, this is what I call the Holy Grail. Um, lots of success stories over the border in England with this. And this is one of my main kind of focuses and pushes in Wales. So it's not reinventing the wheel. But if we can introduce uh, wild bird seed mixes in Wales, it will make a huge, huge difference. Because as I said before, we've got that thing where there's very little seed available at this time of year in Wales and associated farmland bird declines because of that. So if we can introduce seed into this picture, and here we've got a crop of um, quinoa, which is great for so many species, um, then, or oh, sorry, if you're, you know, if you're a bit kind of posher than me, I suppose you might call it quinoa, um, but I always call it quinoa, but this is uh, great for, for feeding um, farmland birds and seed eating birds. So this is a holy grail. Um, this is what it looks like in a livestock setting. Um, so a small field there converted into a wild bird seed mix and uh, around the edge there you've got um, something that isn't a wild bird seed mix. I can't remember what that is off the top of my head, but it looks like something like um, either a dwarf sorghum or something like that. To, and what that will do is, is warm the middle of that, that crop up. Um, so and um, this is probably more likely what you'll see. Instead of having a whole field converted, it's just thin strips along the edges of fields. Uh, this is a nine metre strip in a, on a dairy farm next to a silage field. Um, and this is absolutely fantastic. And the reason I put this picture in is to highlight a point that a lot of the time I'm talking about seed availability through the winter and how important that is. But actually, if you put in things like brassicas, so kale, and if you put in things like chicory, which is the blue flower that you can see here, you get a what's called a biennial mix, which lasts more than one year. And then you've got a crop through the spring and summer. And what that does is you get lots of flowers, but also you've got a really insect rich habitat. And this is really key. So if I was trying to uh, recover a tree sparrow population in this area, I'd be putting up lots of boxes for tree sparrows, and then I'd be situating them near a cover crop like this. And because this is full of insects and you've got all of those insects for them to feed the, the chicks and this is a kind of a proven method for, for conservation so that's really important there as well so a cover crop a wild bird seed mix that's more than one year has so many benefits uh, and is really worth doing if you can and again they're paid for through the stewardships in wales they have been included in glass deer for the past you know eight years or so but the take up of glass deer for starters i think less than one in four farms are in glass deer in wales so it just demonstrates it's not fit for purpose in the first place. So we need to get the uptake of these uh, schemes, but then the, the options within the schemes, the one in glass deer was something like 80% cereal. So that, that stops you really doing a good biennial crop. So it means you've got to establish a crop each year and there's costs of establishment each year. And then you don't get the benefits of these flowers and the insect rich habitat through the spring and summer. So there's lots of changes afoot, hopefully. Um, and it'll all tie in because we're hoping that more farms in Wales will do this type of thing and get more invested in the conservation aspect of it all because obviously if BPS is phased out, farms are going to have to evidence the delivery of what are called public goods. So public goods are air quality, water quality, soil health, but importantly in this instance biodiversity. And if you can evidence and demonstrate that you're doing lots for biodiversity and you've got all the records from doing things like big farm and bird count, and you're recording whether you've got red and amber listed species on your farm and what you're doing for them. We don't know it yet because it's not set in stone and this is all a bit in limbo, but what should be the case is that having all of that information should put you in good stead to access future payments as BPS is phased out. So the benefits of crops in a grassland setting, as I said, we've hardly got any seeds in this grassland setting. This is a great graph to demonstrate this, I think. This is from work up, done up in Scotland. And the ones you can hardly see there are other crops in a grass setting and other crops in an arable setting. So they're black and white right at the bottom, hardly any impact at all. And then we go to the yellow bars and these are in an arable setting and having wild bird seed mixes in an arable setting. Um, and that just shows you the impact of 
drawing birds in at this time of year. It's absolutely fantastic. But what the, the, the research shows is if you do it in the grassland setting, the benefits of this is much more magnified. So you get lots, lots more birds coming in from further afield because there's hardly any seed about. So they, they see this as they're flying around and they all go to it. So that's great. And that increases birds at this time of year. Um, but even the best cover crops will be losing their seed through December and, and certainly in January and they'll become seed depleted as the birds eat the seed so they're not much about at that time and the hungry gap as many of you may know lasts from December all the way through to the end of April and sometimes into May so you've got there you've got February March April where there's not much food around in the environment and our cover crops which are great at the start of the winter aren't really providing that either so we need something else to add on to that and what we do is we add on something called supplementary feeding. And this can be either done by spreading out um, bird mixes along farm tracks or uh, in areas of hard standing or by doing it through hoppers. And these are farmland specific um, feeders. So these are put at, a, at least a meter off the ground. So they're not designed for um, pheasants and partridges and things like that. Although there were, this is where the kind of the idea and the concept came from. There are so many benefits of putting food out for pheasants and partridges because lots of other birds then eat that grain and survive off that grain. And this is where this idea came from for supplementary feeding. It was put into policy, obviously. Um, and over the border in England, it's got great take up. Over in, in Wales, it is. It has been in glass deer, but the majority of the farms that I talk to aren't aware that it's in glass deer at all. Um, and I think the only reason it was put in was for the Twight project, which is in um, Snowdonia. So it is something that was accessible if you'd ever asked for it, if you knew about it. And my hope through doing things like this, and we've got a number of projects running in Wales, is making farms aware of this kind of thing, so that when it comes around to the next scheme, they can actually ask for it. Um, and this you know, has huge impacts on, on lots of seed eating farmland birds. This here is a video. Now these are brambling, as Simon showed you before. So these aren't resident birds. They don't breed in this country. They come in through the winter and they normally form mixed flocks. But doing this supplementary feeding, and you'll see this is next to a cover crop there. So as I said before, habitat is still really, really important. We can't do it without habitat. But putting in supplementary feeding alongside good habitat and wild bird seed mix like this has huge, huge positives. I'll just move on from there. So we know supplementary feeding here, the blue is the number of birds surviving through kind of January, February and March, where you've got supplementary feeding. And the opposite, the red, is where you've got a cover crop still. So good numbers in kind of November, December. But as that seed gets depleted in the cover crop, you then start losing your birds in January, February and March. So um, supplementary feeding, we know, keeps those birds going. Uh, whereas what a lot of people think is those birds will then move on and go somewhere else. But actually, there isn't many other places for them to go. They've just got no food. And what happens is winter mortality is very high. So unfortunately, those birds die. And that also adds to this decline in the birds, the annual decline keeps on going. So we want to stop and reverse that. And what used to be the case is that people used to say, oh, well, you know, supplementary feeding, it draws in the birds from all around. So that's where you get more birds. But then they go away again. And does it make an, does it have an impact in the breeding population? So again, we've done that research and we found that farms with wild bird seed mixes and even those farms where they had forage crops that were grazed off by sheep, where they were doing these techniques within kind of 400 metres and especially within 250 metres, resident birds, so birds that have been here all winter, the numbers of those resident birds was much, much higher. You can see they're pretty much double the number compared to on farms where there was no wild bird seed mix. So we know that not only does it help birds survive through the winter, it gets them into really good breeding condition because they're the right weight, which is very important, and it maximizes their breeding potential. Uh, so you get more breeding birds as, a, as from doing this. And then, so I've kind of covered the habitat. So one, one leg of the stool, I've covered the, the supplementary feeding, whether that's done through habitat, or through seed bearing cover crops or adding in hoppers. And then the last one, if you remember, on my three-legged stool was talking about um, predator control. And as I said, some people aren't fans of this and some people are fans of this. But this is the data from the Allerton project. And you can see here, when we put in habitat, when we put in supplementary feeding, or when we put in predator control, this is what happened 
from 1992, which is our control year where we didn't do anything. We started this work in 1993, and for about an eight-year cycle then, we more than doubled our, our fauna and bird population by doing that. Then what we thought it'd be interesting to do was see what it was that was really making the biggest difference. And we took away the predator control, and those numbers dropped by about a third then what we did was we took away the supplementary feeding and they dropped again by about another third. And you always get fluctuations within this with good breeding years and poor breeding years and all the rest of it. But what we kind of summarised from all of that was that by doing all three, you get your full maximum potential, so that 100% potential. If you only do the habitat, you get about a third of what's, what your potential is. Then adding in the supplementary feeding adds another third and adding that predator control adds another third to that on top. Um, and what we didn't do was rip out all the habitat that we've put in. We didn't think it was worth doing that. So then you can see there when we added all three back into there, we get this increase again going up. So this is our kind of model and this is our, our science. You can see there 2013. I don't know if anyone remembers 2012. Was it? a really wet year followed by quite a cold um horrible kind of winter and spring so we had um a poor breeding year in 2012 so not many birds going through into 2000 year and that explains that drop there but apart from that you can see they're going up and up and up and that's really important to explain there and although i've only got time to talk about and show you this one project we've got loads of examples of this happening on farmer clusters and other projects across the country and we've got a few projects now in Wales as well that are demonstrating this in a livestock setting as well. So that's kind of all the stuff I wanted to talk about of why we do the farm and bird count, what you can do uh, with habitats and all the rest of it to actually reverse the declines in farm and birds. Um, I've just summarised that there. I think I've probably spoken enough about it. Um, but we're really encouraging farmers to do the survey themselves to encourage their neighbours to do the, far, the, the survey as well. So we want to get as many people, as many farmers doing the survey as possible. And as I said, if you're not a farmer, you can do the survey for them. And that's often what we get. We get a lot of farmers saying, oh, I'm not too great with my bird ID. What can I do? Well, first I'd say, you know, attend one of Simon's talks because that was absolutely fantastic. But secondly, when COVID's not around, you know, get a, get a local birder out with you and want to help you. Um, but if we can't do that at the moment, obviously with COVID, so if you're a local birder, you want to go out and do this farm and bird count on one of your farms, please ask permission first to be able to go and access a farm and submit the results for that farmer and really engage the farmer in that, that whole process so that when you get the results back, you can say, oh, look, you know, I saw X number of red listed species, X number of amber listed species and really get them encouraged because that's what we've all got to do. We've all got to kind of uh get an interest in this race standards and as i said the theory is that it should be if we're more focused on this conservation element of it as bps is phased out we should be able to actually attract funding through having increased biodiversity and doing these measures so take binoculars out with you a notepad a pencil um i think it's important to note as well you know most of you will be bird id experts from seeing simon's talk tonight but if you're not quite sure when you go out there please make notes and record little things like whether the bird is hopping or whether it's walking that will help you in some instances believe me um, what color the bird is what size it is so whether it is you know a blackbird size or a sparrow size or a wood pigeon or a buzzard size or whether it's in a flock or on its own all of these things can help uh, please 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 make sure that you send in your records uh, last year across the uk we had over 1500 participants uh, and that number in Wales has grown from about 30 when I started to work for the GWCT in Wales to I think we had 84 last year but I'm really hoping that we smash that 100 participants target in Wales and and really we should be aiming for two 300 records in Wales so we really really want you to do the count but please remember to to upload your results as well and don't just be proud, be loud. So please, you know, tell people about the birds you're seeing and the GWC team will shout um, all of this uh, information for you and really kind of shout about the good work that's been doing on farms and, and how to reverse these declines. And also what we'll be doing as well, what I would say for Ben um, and BIS is if you're happy to, because we haven't been able to set it up so that there's a, an option to click, if you're happy for us to share the information with BIS, what I'd also like you to do 
is if you're happy to, if you you know if you live in Powers and, and the Brecon Beacons, please then once you've uploaded the information onto the um, onto the BFBC website, please then send your information on to Ben and he can then create a record of that. And what we're hoping to do in the future is get a like a link so that people can then share that information with with um, BIS and other recording centres if they wish to. Um, so that's me over and out but the most important thing of all is to enjoy it and do it <laughs> so as i said that's from this friday uh till the 14th and uh, yeah i'd encourage you all to get out and do it so thank you for for listening i think there's lots of questions that have come in as i've been speaking so i'll pass this over to ben i'll stop sharing my screen and uh there's some twitter hashtags as well for you if you use twitter so thanks very much everyone Thanks, Matt. That's great. And I hope that's inspired lots of people to take part in the Big Farm Bird Camp and also giving farms out there some ideas as to do on your land to encourage more birds and more wildlife generally onto, onto your farms. Just to reiterate what Matt said about the Big Farm and Bird Count, the records go to the big farm and bird count and i don't think they go anywhere else so if you wish to it'd be great if you could share your records with us using the lurk whales app or the iRecord app especially if you're in the brecon beacons national park or in powys but anywhere within the uk you can use the iRecord app to record a second time i know it means recording it again a second time but it's really useful information for us as well as for the big farm and bird count as well. So please do share your records. And then all throughout the year, you can keep making records and record the wildlife that you see out and about on your farms, in your gardens, or just when you're out on a walk or something like that. So do have a look at the iRecord and the LERC Wales app on your smartphone. Or if you prefer using your computer, then rather than a smartphone, then the iRecord website is a really good way to Called the general wildlife that you see. I realise it's getting close to some people's bedtimes, so um, I've got a few questions, comments, Matt, which possibly you'd be the best person to answer. Uh, a little bit about predator control, and Sam Hale asks about using electric fences which I think you mentioned as well. So that, that's a kind of non, maybe non-lethal method of protecting birds on certain areas by the use of yep, it. Definitely. Yeah, I can, I can just do a quick thing on that. Um, so electric fences are really useful for, the, for waders or ground nesting bird species and waders in particular. Um, they're more useful for things like lapwings. And again, uh, lapwings especially, I, I know I've mentioned the whole talk about this being on farmland, but if I was to talk about nature reserves, um, using electric fences on those obviously has fantastic results. They can electric fence a whole lot. You've got multiple pairs of especially lapwings nesting in colonies, and that protects them from foxes and badgers, so it protects them eating the eggs. What you also get in that scenario is an area that can be fenced off that actually protects the chicks while they're, while they're foraging. So great results with that. On farmland, those fallow plots that I mentioned before, and you will still get kind of colonies of lapwing nesting, so you can still fence an area around there, and it certainly increases the hatch, hatching success, so you'll get more chicks from doing that. If you can fence off a big enough area and a foraging area, then what you're doing there is you're protecting the chicks from um, ground predators, so foxes and things like that, but less so from aerial predators. Um, so that's one thing to, to take into account. And then curlew are the other species to mention. So curlew, although when you've got really fantastic habitat, so up on kind of moorland edges and in by land and things like that, you'll get smaller territories. I think in Wales, we tend to, them, to be thinking of them as quite territorial. But where you've got fantastic habitat, which is quite a key thing, really, the, the territories aren't so big. So you get lots of them together um, and you can electric fence areas like that. But what I would say, in, areas of Wales where they're territorial, you can, there is success from uh, electric fencing off individual nests. Although what I would say is make sure, or please make sure that you're getting in, involved with some experts, whether that's ourselves, whether that's the RSPB, whether that's Curly Country, um, to, to do that and get the, the advice of an ornithologist because 
the biggest threat in that instance is probably disturbance. So by going out and, and putting up an electric fence around a nest, you're going to cause a bird to, to go off the nest. And if you spend too long doing that, they can actually, the, the eggs will go cold. Um, so the biggest thing really is to get, you know, professional advice if you're thinking of doing anything like that. But where it has been done under projects with professionals doing it, it has increased the hatch rate again. But what tends to happen then is as soon as those birds have hatched, they're out and about into an area which is unfenced and they're easy pickings for lots of other things. So what happens is you increase your hatch success, but you don't tend to increase your fledging success when you're just doing electric fencing on its own. That's when you need the other aspects of predator control to play a part. And obviously what I would say is that predator control is just about minimizing predation pressure. You know, even in areas where lots of predator control goes on, we're not talking about uh, making predators extinct completely from a local area. And we've got the data to prove that, you know, um, quite a topical thing with grouse moors and things like that. But these are keepers that predator control is their bread and butter on things like foxes. But our data suggests that even when they're doing that full time, I think it was only something like 48% of the fox population was controlled. So they were only halving those fox numbers. But just by doing that, they were able to get uh, curlew from fledging so 15% of pairs were fledging without any predator control and then by controlling half the fox population they're able to increase that to 51 pairs of curlew uh, were fledging young and that in itself was leading to a, an increase I think 14% per annum once those chicks became adults so we, we've got lots of evidence to suggest that predator control works but hopefully that answers uh, the electric fencing question. I'll just go off the cuff and answer just I, I can't remember what was said on barn owls and nest boxes just before I started but one thing I do know and I don't know if it was mentioned but putting two nest boxes up per pair actually really increases the chances of those boxes being used because it gives the male another roost site away from the, the one those chicks have obviously got to the point where they're fledging and they're quite big and there's three potentially four in the box um, it gives the male somewhere else to go so that's something that another little hint or tip that can be, be used. I can see Simon nodding, so I'm glad that he's nodding. I don't yeah, know if it was mentioned yeah, before, so sorry if I missed it. Yeah, that's good as well, because Jackie, who raised that point about whether it was better to use barn art boxes in trees or in a barn, she said she had one of each, so that's obviously two, or at least two, which, as you just say, is a good idea. So don't yeah. just have one, put, put two up, which is a good I'm of, Yeah, I'm of the thought now that they should be called... Um, you know, box owls, because <laughs> there's a lot of barns that have been converted or blocked off. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think you tend to get a lot more of the nesting in nest boxes rather than barns these days. So I think apart from a tree, obviously, you want to have a tree that's away from woodland, along meadows and things like that. So an oak tree on its own somewhere is a good place to put them. But you get a lot of success just putting them on old telegraph poles as well and things like that. So good, good advice. Um, the, the volume of water, I think that came up in your talk, uh, was um, reiterated by Matt Smith, who says that where he is, the raptors, um, the, you see, he often sees them tracking along the water courses. So just shows you the value of having standing water on your farms. Yeah, with that, I just say that a lot of our predators kind of hunt along linear routes. Um, and I mentioned before with the ryegrass about having a five or six metre margin. There's a lot of evidence to say that once your margin goes kind of 15 metres and above, the, the predation rates drop massively because what it forces things like foxes to do, instead of searching just a linear route, is actually search through all of that. And there's lots less chance of them actually finding anything within there. So the bigger the margin and the less kind of linear the feature is, the better protection from predators. And for those, I think, that were talking about raptors and predation and all that kind of stuff, obviously the trust only advocates legal predator control of those species that, uh, that you can legally control. But what I would say is that's where it highlights the importance of good habitat. Good habitat in itself um, will do an awful lot of protection from predators. And one of the issues that we've got is obviously the, the intensification of agriculture, as, as has been mentioned. Um, has diminished or minimised the amount of good habitat that we've got. So where we can, we want to be putting in that good habitat. Where you've got a balance, obviously, food production, as every farm has to. These are other techniques that I've mentioned. So um, really enhancing areas. 
ecologically enhancing areas and providing cover and seed and things from wild bird seed mixes or supplementary feeding or predator control. That's where they kind of have that benefit where we're struggling to, you know, as I said, we're not talking about nature reserves and we can't, we can't feed the nation, we can't feed the, the rest of the world that we export to by doing that. So it's important to mention. Okay, we've got a, going on to habitat question here from William, who sounds like he's got a really nice farm, if, if he's a farmer, um, with red kites, three to five a day, skylarks being active, lapwings seen at the weekend, and grey partridge as well. So it sounds like a good place where William Hare is. But he's asking, what can we do in grassland to help skylarks? I think you mentioned those fallow areas. I did, yeah. I think the best thing you can do in a grassland to help skylarks is to plant a, a spring sown cereal. Um, but apart from that, I think it's uh, you, what you need to do on grassland is manage the, the habitat so you get the grazing pressure right, so you get a bit of a mosaic of habitats um, with some shorter areas, some thicker areas and that kind of stuff. Um, and you certainly do get skylarks on, on grasslands. So they'll certainly use them. Um, but the best thing that you could possibly do, and again, this can be grant aided through a scheme, is to introduce a spring sown cereal crop. But for grass and farmers, what I would say is if you've got, you know, grass layer that's been there for quite a long time, just make sure you don't need to do an environmental impact assessment first, because we've got these kind of regulations about the amount of grass pasture we've got. And then also uh, you want to watch out for things like wireworm and things like that, which can affect arable crops after it's been in a grass layer for a long time. William just adds that he's in a grassland oasis in arable seas, so very poetic. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. To encourage um, skylarks as well. Um, Kath briefly asked, what about, are there any benefits of bracken to birds? I would suspect it's more the cover that they would provide and shelter. That's it. Yeah, I think I answered that one within the questions before I, before I started. So um, if, I think, Kath, did you see the answer to that? Because that was your question, wasn't it? That's good to move on for that one so we can get to, to bed on time. One, Some of the ones I can see here are one from Ben saying, could it be that there are less prey? So the effect of predators has a bigger impact on populations. And one from Kate, and I won't attempt to, to pronounce your second name, Kate, I'm sorry about that, but more, more peasant, but I think you mean pheasant and red-legged partridges introduced for shoots, bringing more predators than before. And I think that the, the answer is somewhere in the middle of all of that. So the first question, First, the one I mentioned from Ben, is that that typical kind of predator-prey relationship that most of us will have learned in school with the, you know, the, the snow hare and the, the lynx, um, and then following each other and going up and down, that doesn't tend to actually happen, um, especially in the UK with our, with our farmed landscape, because as you've mentioned there, that the predators and the apex predators are generalist predators in the UK, and they rely on lots of other species. So what we found, especially with grey partridges, is that you know, your predators can have an impact on that one species, but then as that species declines, the, the, the generalist predator that will then switch its prey source to a different predator, so to a different prey, sorry, so it will never itself kind of decline, whereas you've just decimated that one prey population. Um, and then the other thing is that because of the reduction in habitat and all the rest, as we get to very low populations, these low populations are less able to cope with predation pressure as well. So they become much closer to dropping off a cliff completely. Whereas if they had more of a population, it wouldn't have as much of an effect really. And then on to Kate about the pheasants and the, the red-legged partridges. I just mentioned, I think Kate before put a report from the RSPB looking into shooting. And, and of course, please, you know, all feel free to read that one. It's important that this is a balanced debate and we get every side of the argument. But I also then put on uh, a paper by Rufus Sage who has looked into this too. He works for the GWCT and actually it's funny or it's, it's interesting, not funny, to look at the different conclusions looking from the same literature because if you weight the positives and the negatives in the same kind of categories, what you get is a, almost like a neutral impact. So there are many positives associated with, with um, game management from supplementary feeding and habitat management to predator control to woodland management, all of these different things. But there are negatives, you know, there are associated things around the release pen. So there's impacts on flora within a woodland around the release pen. There's also negatives um, through the illegal persecution of, of raptors, which is a, you know, a real negative. Um, but what you do, if you just weight those equally, what you end up with is about the same amount of positives and neutrals as, as negatives. 
And then within our management, what we can do then is really kind of maximize the positives and minimize the negatives. So you get what's called the net gain to biodiversity. And again, this is a kind of proven concept. So net gain to biodiversity basically means that there's more biodiversity as a result of having a farm on a shoot than there would be if that shoot wasn't there. But certainly, you know, I'm not going to sit here and lie. There are the negatives and there are places which aren't maximizing the, the positives and perhaps are, are maximizing the negatives. And in that case, you've got a negative picture. But what the RSPB did in their report was actually lump all of the positives together into one block. And actually the negatives and kind of move those about and get more of them. So what you get there is it looks a lot more negative than actually if you review that literature yourself and look through it. So that's why I put both of those there. Um, and the link with predators and more pheasants and red leg partridges, there's a proven correlation with um, with pheasants and red leg partridges release and numbers of predators, but there isn't a proven cause and effect. Now again, you know, this isn't black and white. The truth will be somewhere in the middle. I'm quite happy to say that. But you've got so many variables. You've got urban populations. You've got um, farming practices. And one really kind of clear thing from this that I think is key in Wales especially is that this link with carrion crows and pheasant releases and predators and that side of it is that the, the big kind of boom in carrion crow numbers was around the 70s when we got kind of increased stocking densities and what carrion crows like is a short sward height, which goes hand in hand with sheep farming. What we haven't seen with carrion crows is a big boom in numbers since what's happened with whales with increases in pheasants more so in the last decade or so. So put simply, I think more research is needed into that. I'm not disagreeing with Kate, but I'm saying that it's a much more kind of complicated picture. And what we should have is good shoots, doing their predator control, benefiting birds for conservation, and we shouldn't have that spillover. And what sometimes we don't get with poor practice is it shoots not doing the predator control at the right time of year. So again, that's that maximizing the negatives instead of maximizing the positives. So it's a very complicated picture. So I just wanted to hopefully answer that from a, uh, as much as I can be non-biased point of view, really, because the trust isn't a shooting uh, lobbying organization. It's a, what I would say is a pro-game management organisation that's based on the science. So we do scientific research and we use that research. And, and what we found is a lot of game management practices have an awful lot of benefits, as, as you've seen from, from tonight's kind of talk, I suppose. So hopefully that will answer that one. Thanks, Matt. I was, you almost read my mind because I kind of lumped all those together and they were the next ones that I was just going to bring up. But that's they were just the ones I could see. <laughs> yeah, and I, in the chat, I posted those two reports right next to each other. So you, if you want to... Great, thank you. Both of those, you'll be able to see those. And I think Kate then mentioned Grey Partridge is a red-listed bird, sadly, though. And I think, again, it's more to do with changes in agriculture as to why that decline happened. But if you look at any areas where grey partridges are actually increasing, it's where they're managed by shoots, not specifically for shooting, because they will only shoot once that wild population's got over a certain threshold. And to be honest, many shoots are doing the conservation not to shoot them, just because it's an iconic species. So it is red listed. It's also a game bird with a season, but that kind of incentive is what's driving the conservation recovery in those localized areas. And I would say if you had that incentive everywhere, you'd have great partridges everywhere. So it's a really interesting, that one. It's an interesting piece. Hopefully we're getting through these questions now. <laughs> yeah, I think, no, I, think that, that I wrote all the questions down that I could see. I don't think there's any more. I think we've covered most of them. I think we, we should start to, to wind up now and finish up. Um, the audience is dropping in number and we may end up debating this all night as is probably <laughs> yeah. we just may end up talking to ourselves so yeah um, it's just I'm sorry it's so one-sided obviously it's just me talking at you <laughs> yeah so that's great um just one last question or comment from simon can i just ask you a question somebody um Ev was saying that she often runs at night and flushes birds out and yes. would it be most likely to be snipe or would you can you flush curlew out yeah more likely snipe or possibly woodcock. Yeah, I'd, I'd say woodcock. Yeah, yeah. Depending um, on where you're running, obviously. We've got uh, we've got folks who go ringing waders at night up in the hills um, above Newtown, 
and they come across Snipe and Woodcock. Well, I think that's... I've got a question for Matt. Oh, just, yes, Simon, go just on. before we go, and that is, here in Wales, we're not even allowed to drive to take our exercise. Yes. So um, don't be too upset if you don't have many takers for your farmland bird counts because of course yeah get to the good areas yeah yeah no we're completely rely reliant on people being able to to walk to those areas where you know where they're going to do yeah. the count and as i said that the main thing with this is trying to encourage farmers to do the count and obviously every farmer would be able to go onto their own farm but if you're not a farmer and you want to do the big farm with bird count that's a really important point simon is that you should be able to reach that place where you're going without driving so you should be able to walk there as exercise or run there yeah uh, you, you know but make sure you catch your breath before you do the survey otherwise you'll you'll put all the birds off <laughs> anyway <laughs> on, thanks the, on the point of oh thank you simon mm -hmm. on the point of woodcock actually we've got a really nice project going on in wales at the moment which is just starting and it's using woodcock as an indicator of soil health because obviously they're probing the ground, they're probing the ground for invertebrates, and where you've got things like compaction in a field and that kind of thing, you you know, it, they won't be using those areas. So instead of some kind of fancy mapping techniques and all the rest of it, we're simply going out and counting woodcock at night with thermal images or a lamp, and they're showing up in areas of the field where, the, you know, there's, or what we're hoping to prove is there's better, um, better soil health. So that's a really nice one, actually, to just kind of finish on, I suppose.